Stephen, I can't hear you. Ah, you're on mute. Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Harassus USA meeting and this special plenary titled Developing Digital Assets and Developing Social Welfare. My name is Stephen Melnick, and by way of introduction, just a little bit about myself first. I'm a tenure professor in the largest business school in the United States, Park City University of New York. I'm also a partner in Global Investment Bank, where we try to democratize access to U.S. capital markets by bringing uh, companies from all over the world to Wall Street and also empowering those who create progress around the world by enabling them to up, up, uh, obtain funding through securitization of their intellectual property and listing in NASDAQ. And I'm also a proud honorary member of the advisory board of Liberal and Aid Foundation, <clears throat> nonprofit that helps and delivers uh, humanitarian aid uh, into many different parts of the world, very much needed humanitarian aid. But last but not least, least um, I'm a director here at Terrasis, <clears throat> and it's my absolute honor to work side by side with global visionary and well-recognized leader in political economic community, Dr. Richter. With all that said, we have enormous conversation today. Um, it's difficult not to acknowledge what's happening in Ukraine, of course, and especially somebody like myself who immigrated from Ukraine uh, about 30 years ago to the United States. And today, many of you witnessed the uh, amazing plenary that we had uh, dedicated specifically to Ukraine with members of Ukrainian government trying to get their laptops in between hiding from bombings. So our prayers are with the Ukrainian people and hopefully no person uh, should continue to die and this whole nonsense and madness will stop. But as we all know, on a certain level, politics and money converge, right? And we see where the money world is moving uh, in terms of crypto in terms of digital assets, and this is something that seems to be inevitable. And the question that we're wondering, what will this movement create for the world? How will it help uplift societies around the world? Can it help prevent disasters like the ones we're dealing with now? So these are some of many, many topics that we'll try to cover today. And of course, because of the turmoil that happens around the world, um, you know, there are other government officials and plenary members that uh, are planning to be with us and maybe they'll join us as we speak, but many things are happening. We're supposed to have also a minister from Moldova, we all know, uh, under what pressure that country is and uh, also representatives of mayor's office, New York City commissioner. So we'll see how we go. Uh, I keep getting updates as people may be joining us. But with all that said, um, I'd like to first start by introducing uh, somebody who is very well known and respected around the world, a chairman of Asatera Group, Anton Schmitzbauer. Just a few words uh, about Anton, and Anton, I'll ask you to uh, supplement. But uh, of course, you know, some people don't need big introductions. You're certainly one of them. And we could spend half of this time uh, going through your bio. But uh, Anton is a serial entrepreneur uh, with physics, math, um, uh, academic background, and um, focusing his time on areas of um, blockchain, uh, fintech, uh, and, and of course, uh, sustainable energy. Anton, thank you very much for joining us today and Thanks. welcome to this important conversation. It's a pleasure to be here. And Anton, by the way, if you, in case you cannot tell from accent, he's in Austria right now. Uh, so welcome, welcome, welcome. Anton, maybe what we should do first is start by stepping back a little bit because while you and many other members of the community are very versed in all the terminologies and topics. Uh, but let's not forget that many people are still not very familiar with concepts of digital money, digital assets. So maybe as a first step, uh, if you could be so kind just to educate us a little bit and explain to those of us who are not very familiar with this world, um, mm -hmm. what is it that we're talking about? What, what do we mean by digital assets, digital economy? Yeah, so uh, let's say uh, when you look at the, at the existing world, so we are in a centralized uh, uh, financial system. That means money is in the bank. Banks are uh, intermediaries are controlling uh, the flows of, uh, let's say, asset and wealth all around the world. When you do a transaction, you always need uh, to uh, include your bank. With uh, next generation uh, of services, so mainly uh, uh, let's say, developed out of the 
blockchain and first cryptocurrency industry, also new services uh, called uh, decentralized, uh, decentralized finance will be established or are established and will be ex- established over the next couple of years. Uh, what does it mean? So uh, a decentralized uh, financial service is that not the bank has control over your assets. You as an individual uh, can do peer-to-peer transactions, immediate transactions uh, with more or less any type of assets uh, uh, you can imagine. And so the let's say we are here not talking about oh, what is a digital asset. It's more or less a represent, a represent and access uh, to a to a, uh, uh, let's say, a, an asset class, uh, a liquid or illiquid asset class, a physical or non-physical uh, uh, asset class. Uh, besides, uh, yeah. if, I, if I may ask you a question before we go mm-hmm. into many details on this. Um, yeah. So as economies of the world standing by, and especially mm-hmm. during these difficult times, and there are you know, many very still in, in today's age, I mean, it's, it's crazy that we deal with wars, but even putting aside war, mm-hmm. Uh, many countries that have enormous resources are still poor. They still cannot uh, provide basic needs for their population. Uh, And they don't have the funding, they don't have the money to exploit these resources. Mm -hmm. Um, I know that this is one of the areas that uh, you you have developed as a visionary solution for the world. Could you just talk about that? How can we use this latest technology to elevate the social well-being of masses around the world? Yeah. So what we developed is, uh, let's say, uh, first of all, I would say we are a regulated uh, infrastructure. So we also own our own bank. We own a, a fully regulated uh, a digital exchange, all under European Union uh, regulations. And uh, uh, what we are aiming and what we are positioning at the moment is uh, to establish all these services around the new uh, uh, MICA uh, 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 framework given by the European Union on digital financial services. So this is, let's say, the playground where we're starting at. Uh, because we see regulation as a, a key point. So governments and our society needs certain kind of financial uh, regulation and uh, compliance in that services. But what we are aiming here is to harmonize, let's say, any type of asset class into your asset and wealth uh, management and into your financial services. That means on one hand, you have fiat, let's say uh, uh, US dollar, euro, et cetera, et cetera. Then you have the classical financial instruments, stocks and bonds. Then, of course, this new arising, uh, let's say, huge uh, demand on on, uh, uh, cryptocurrencies. But there is a new way that means uh, we have a lot of liquid and illiquid assets on this planet, like precious metals, like environmental commodities, et cetera, et cetera, which are key in our future society. And therefore, to uh, develop uh, uh, asset-backed securities out of it or futures out of it to make sure not only a few people can, let's say, or uh, industries can uh, uh, participate in uh, uh, precious metals in uh, 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 raw materials used for uh, the e-mobility or the batteries for e-mobility or other environmental commodities like carbon credits, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Also, to establish these kind of uh, illiquid or liquid physical or non-physical assets to a broader audience as a kind of uh, investment, asset management, wealth management instrument or also, of course, peer-to-peer to do settlements, clearing and settlements uh, between different asset classes. So Got this it. is the key behind the network. Okay, so we'll come back to this. And I see uh, the commissioner of uh, New York City on Foreign Affairs just joined us, um, someone who for many years um, I'm very happy to uh, call a friend. Uh, can you hear us well? I hear you Hello. just fine. I'm going to the volume a little bit. Okay, very good. So this is Mr. Edward Mermelstein, and just by way of introduction, um, currently serving, as I said, as a Commissioner of International Affairs uh, within the administration of uh, Mayor uh, Eric Adams. And uh, Mr. Mermelstein himself had a phenomenal career prior to uh, entering the world of politics and uh, actually was uh, ranked one of the top 10 uh, influencers uh, in the real estate market in New York and ran one and only 
um, organization that uh, it's actually that's the name of it, one and only that dealt with uh, private equity and investments and legal related, international related matters in real estate. And uh, I know he's bringing the same level of passion, energy and tenacity into City Hall. So, uh, Edward, thank you for joining us very much. See, thank you so much uh, for having me and apologies uh, for the technical difficulties yesterday. Everything was working fine, but here we are. Uh, so uh, as uh, Steve already introduced me, I'm uh, New York City's uh, Commissioner for International Affairs, and uh, it's a pleasure and honor to be in front of all of you. Um, and on behalf of Eric Adams, I'm very proud that New York City is home to the largest diplomatic community in the world, which includes more than 70 trade commissions, 116 consulates, 193 permanent missions, and uh, the headquarters, of course, of the United Nations is here. Uh, my job to connect these entities with New York City is, um, is uh, not an easy one these days, as you can imagine, um, uh, especially with what's going on all over the globe. Um, so I, I wanted to also thank the organizers for inviting me to this uh, event and uh, for allowing me to discuss uh, everything that I've done in the last couple of months as commissioner. I'm, thrilled. I'm thrilled to be with all of you. Um, and um, Steve, uh, if, if you uh, want me to uh, go through everything that we do, I'm happy to do yeah. that. Thank you. Thank you, Edward. First of all, thank you for taking time from your crazy, hectic schedule to join us. Uh, everyone appreciates it very much. Um, and I know th there are many initiatives that uh, Mayor Adams put forward. Uh, and one of the topics and the themes of this conversation, of course, is um, elevating social capital of the world, right? And, and bringing uh, better well-being to the to people around the world. And of course, the topic being USA for this harasses meeting, and there is no city that represents better uh, United States than New York City from many, many different perspectives. And in many ways, it also represents the world in terms of its diversity. So um, I know that while many governments, uh, both f federal, local around the world, kind of staying away from this big wave of technology, uh, that's certainly not the case uh, under Mayor uh, Adams' um, uh, view and perspective and guidance and leadership. Uh, could you share with us um, specific initiatives uh, that are taking place within City Hall in that direction, in, in perhaps bringing this latest technology, uh, digital world, into New York City to benefit its residents? Sure. Um, in fact, uh, we just had a meeting recently with um, the com well, uh, he's the chief technology officer, which is technically uh, higher than the commissioner. It's um, a deputy mayor position. Um, New York City is going to be going uh, through a, a huge transformation. And um, as, as you mentioned, uh, much of it has to do with uh, creating a more equitable society, a more equitable city. Um, and uh, w one of the uh, simplest examples uh, that is being initiated before we transform our city into the technological capital of the world, which is... Uh, the goal across all of our agencies. Uh, we, we have a great initiative that's bringing uh, Wi-Fi, internet, um, and um, cable services to uh, all the residents of NYCHA, which is uh, New York City Housing Authority. Um, it's underwritten by New York City and the federal government, so everyone living in uh, these public housing facilities is going to have free internet um, within the next few months. And uh, the negotiation that took place with uh, all, all of the carriers that uh, supply New York with um, broadband uh, was taken care of really within basically a month. Um, and uh, that's, that's the goal of uh, the city is to uh, simplify things, make it uh, as equitable as possible. And um, you know, th th while this is a very simple uh, example, uh, we, we are uh, consolidating all of our technology offices in New York City into one. Um, we are forming initiatives uh, to be leaders in uh, blockchain technology um, and and tr truly uh, ac across the board, uh, 
of the technology space, but always keeping in mind all social issues. And one of the reasons why I'm sitting in this office is that I do recognize that without the economic component, um, we can't move forward many of these issues. So uh, the, the city is really melding uh, these uh, two concepts of uh, equity and economy and uh, putting them together so that uh, we can make uh, make the city a better place for everyone that's living here, um, but at the same time, uh, make New York City a financially stable city. And um, we have we have a great leader and a great leadership in the city to do that now. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, thank you, uh, Edward. And I know the, the big name is bringing New York City back and regaining its title as the greatest city in the world. And I see a lot of initiatives that move in that direction. Anton, uh, speaking of governments and their involvements, and I know you have an amazing career also as a member of the steering committee for the European Union that really helped shape all the, some, some of the related laws. Um, there's a lot, at some point, it seems like in some circles, uh, people look at it as, as two different worlds, almost unconnected. There is this technology world, uh, and almost like a wild west Right, and some people taking advantage of it. Some people doing the right thing the right way, and in, as in, as Edward saying, bring bring equity into societies. Others just simply benefit from it. And there is the world of government, uh, and that's of course split. Some of them shine away. Some of them are scared of these changes uh, with a lot of entrenched interests, and some of them kind of moving forward. So uh, through your role uh, in, in the European Union Commission on these matters. Um, how does that translate into, into what you do um, as visionary and leader in, in the space, global space of uh, blockchain and, and digital assets and overall digital economy? Yeah, first of all, I would say uh, as we are, as our society is built in, let's say, governments, regulations, et cetera, et cetera. So we cannot say, okay, now we are starting a financial and an economic infrastructure where, which is Wild West, where everyone can do whatever he wants. So uh, we have regulations. We have to do uh, in a compliant way. So only a few topics, anti-money laundering, uh, counter-terrorism financing, et cetera, et cetera. This has to be also the goal in the future. Uh, but let's say certain infrastructure services which are given at the moment, which are specific built on a centralized form. That means the bank is, let's say, the key of each and every transaction. Uh, this will be changed by technology uh, during the next time. So the, uh, all this, what happened with, let's say, the, the cryptocurrencies and all these hypes over the last couple of years showcase that uh, new financial services and new financial ecosystems will be established. Also, governments are jumping on that boat, the digital yuan. So what China is doing uh, is a good example for that. And this kind of technology gives us a few advantages. That means, first of all, transactions can be done uh, immediately, instantly. Uh, there is no need of huge, uh, 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 let's say, settlement, uh, 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 clearing processes anymore. We can do, if we decide, okay, you have an asset, Stephen, I want to buy or I want to purchase this asset and I have an asset which you say, okay, this is for you, an asset class you can uh, uh, accept as, an, uh, as a, a medium to exchange. And then we can do this peer-to-peer -peer without any other body involved. But this is exactly why we say what we are building is here a regulated DeFi network is. Of course, there have to be some verifications uh, and uh, certifications on the transactions involved. One thing is the compliance stuff aside, which makes sure that we are not dealing illegal things. The other thing is, of course, taxation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But uh, also to make sure that, let's say, within a certain given regulated environment, we are handled as uh, 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 in the in the in the proper way. And this is the goal for the future uh, to change and to harmonize. Let's say digital assets and all type of asset-backed commodities or securities or futures into a financial infrastructure to also create, uh, let's say, uh, social welfare in that case, but in a compliant and uh, uh, regulated infrastructure. Yeah. Thank you, Anton. Um, 
Edward, back to you. Uh, you know, one of the things that we pride ourselves at at Harasses is not to simply have discussions and, and people coming in and putting their usual check marks, but to try to bring out not just the, the most important topics, but some resolutions, some solutions, some pathway to make things better. And what I'm curious about, Edward, from your perspective, what is it that private community innovators like Mr. Schwarzbauer uh, can do to help governments like yours in, in, in achieving your goals? Uh, well, uh, great question, Stephen. Um, <laughs> we, we are uh, in many ways um, learning from scratch here because uh, we, we do have uh, so many new uh, pieces to our government and the fact that uh, so much has happened in the last two years as a result of COVID uh, the innovations that we're seeing uh, that need to be uh, implemented into these government structures. And uh, we, just, we just heard about uh, a portion of that process, and we're actually doing exactly that. And uh, our chief technology officer, um, Matt Frazier, is uh, tasked with this uh, not, not very simple task. But uh, I can tell you that uh, we, we are uh, reaching out to some of the uh, greatest minds in the space, um, uh, whether it's a blockchain or, uh, or the medical technology space, uh, uh, what, what is related to the technology space. We are reaching out to the top people. Uh, we're telling them that New York is open for business and we want their business. We are bringing best practices to the city we're reaching out to every government around the world that's doing something better than us. And we're asking them, help us implement it in New York. And we're doing the same thing for them. So just recently, uh, we, had, uh, we had a delegation that came to New York because apparently and this is something that I didn't know, but um, our water system is uh, considered one of the best, if not the best in the world. And the, the technology to keep it clean and um, and uh, servicing uh, almost nine million people is is not very simple. So uh, these these are uh, these are the directions that the city is taking. And uh, most of the commissioners that came into this office are coming in with the same mindset of how do we bring in um, best practices from anywhere that uh, may be doing something better than New York? How do we implement it in New York? So. I'm not sure if that answers your question, but um, that's that's the mindset of this new administration. Wonderful, and that's 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 very good to hear uh, for many reasons and many levels. I'm sure to all the New Yorkers and uh, and all the New Yorkers who are no longer in New York who are hoping to come back. So I think this is this is wonderful, um, Anton. When we talk about and, and just to kind of declassify um, DeFi, when we mentioned is decentralized finance. And looking at what's happening in the world right now and Russia being cut out from SWIFT, right? And, you know, pretty meaningful measure that could have, obviously will have serious consequences on Russian economy. But what makes me wonder, <clears throat> if we enter into the world, world of DeFi and there is no SWIFT, let's say, type of network, how can governments of the world try to impose sanctions, let's say, on these types of situations, if there is no switch to be turned, and if if it's so decentralized, uh, this is a good question. So, uh, to be honest, let's say uh, we are we are now in this. So, first of all, I'm not a politician. To be honest, uh, we are in this in this war since or in this crazy invasion since nine days. Uh, I guess. Uh, a sanction like uh, cutting off someone uh, or a country from the SWIFT system uh, was more or less theoretically be discussed, but never been, uh, 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 there was never a situation that this would really be the case. Uh, I would say, of course, in DeFi networks, it's a bit more complicated to uh, uh, structure such uh, uh, restrictions, but of course, when we come into a regulated infrastructure where we have certain compliance processes, where we have certain verification processes for transactions in place, 
uh, more or less the same mythology can be uh, uh, used. Uh, I cannot cut off, of course, as uh, someone is uh, uh, dealing peer-to-peer -peer with another person. But the limitations I can give in a peer-to-peer -peer network is that, let's say, the counterparty is not allowed to do a transaction with That's someone true. from uh, a country coming uh, X, Y, Z, or some oligarch or whoever sessions are at the moment. And if you do so, and this is why regulation is necessary and some verification points on transactions are necessary, you can, let's say, uh, 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 charge the other person who, do, who is doing that illegal transaction mm -hmm. on the site. And this is important, this, let's say, combining the new and old world in a, in a way together because there will be not a, tra this is a transition phase. Let's say we cannot say we are switching from one system to another system. This will take five years, 10 years, maybe 20 years. We all don't know, but we have to develop mechanisms into that system to make sure we can do theoretically the same uh, uh, sanctions as we are doing in these centralized systems at the moment. And maybe we can do it much easier because let's say we are only have to take care of the identities involved in transactions and see uh, and not uh, having a technical infrastructure which has to be switched on switch off in different in different manners we only have to sanction let's say uh, to make sure we are sanctioning the people who are doing transactions with people who, which they are not allowed or make them uh, uh, even not possible in such uh, 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 infrastructures. Anton, I love the answer for two yeah. point, for two reasons. Yeah. One is uh, what you said makes perfect sense, but more importantly to me, it just demonstrates how creators like you operate. I mean, I, I, I threw an oddball at you of a question, which is a really tough question, but uh, while starting point was, was interesting, you actually developed an answer, right? And that's that's how creators operate. Uh, and this is exactly, in my mind, the difference between the Wild West and regulated finance, okay, which is what exactly what you're doing. And at the end of the day, the governments to come in and, and put in some, some guidelines in, into what can and cannot be done at the end of the day uh, when it comes to at least political matters of some sort. So this is very helpful. Um, Edward, in talking, uh, when we discuss <clears throat> bringing New York City back economically and equality, I, I'd like to share with you something. About two months ago, speaking of some interesting practices, I, I, I don't know if these, I could call them best practices, but certainly interesting practices. About two months ago, I was uh, part of a state visit to, to El Salvador. And with everything that we hear, uh, and again, the topic of this conversation is how you know, digital finance and, and crypto and things of that nature transform society. With everything that I've seen and read before actually going there and sitting down with ministers of finance at the president's office, uh, to be honest with you, I was uh, very surprised and blown away. I mean, the economy uh, is booming in many ways. Companies from all over the world coming in, uh, investing, creating jobs. Uh, real estate is booming uh, because there's a lot of demand for it. Um, so it makes me wonder, you know, is this something that... I, I know there's a lot of tension, again, in the traditional world and certainly for, you know, big governments, let alone cities. But I wonder if, if you know, if there is a consideration uh, of this notion that maybe, you know, infusing some, some element of crypto world actually in, in the live stream of the city itself, uh, besides inviting companies to, to set up their headquarters, could maybe facilitate something like that in the United States. What do you think? Um, that's... Um great point and uh it's actually it's been discussed uh the thing is is uh, that new york city and uh well beyond new york city the the u.s but new york city alone uh is the 10th largest economy in the world so it's uh, comparing um a rowboat uh to a cruise ship and uh while 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 you can turn a rowboat very quickly uh, the cruise ship is going to take a little bit longer to turn so uh, that, that's, that's, I think, um, an analogy that I would uh, <laughs> respond with, that we're heading in that direction. It's coming, and everyone knows it's coming. Um, and uh, little things that need to change, whether it's um, uh, adjusting our bit license or removing the bit license in this conversation is uh, something that is taking place right now um, in Albany. 
it's going to take time. It's going to happen. And uh, one way or another, uh, at least under this administration, the next four years, we will do everything possible to make that happen. Wonderful. Well, I, th I think the world is very happy to hear this because after all, New York is still New York, no matter what, no matter how. And and enhancing its ability and support to global businesses in that way, I think would be phenomenal because I think everyone at this point agrees that you know, digital economy is certainly the future. I mean, it's just a matter of pace and how it goes, both on private and, and government levels. I, I'm very happy to see those who are also like then um, to be part of this very important discussion with us. Uh, I hope I hope you have questions. I see already some somebody has a question. So I will be very happy to allocate maybe last five, 10 minutes of our discussion. And, and I will be very happy to give an opportunity to ask questions. Um, uh, and for now, I just want to go back, Anton, to you. So but, we but before, I guess, uh, uh, someone was uh, uh, asking to to uh, uh, asking a question here. I don't know if uh, Amandeep Mita asked for the microphone. <laughs> Uh, I mean, yes, no, I acknowledge that, but I'm going to allocate last five, ten minutes to the okay, question. Good. I just mm -hmm. want to make sure we, we cover the program first. So mm -hmm. my question to you, Anton, is uh, we have uh, many global leaders from, from all over the world, both political, economic, thought leaders that participate in our discussions that harass us. And many, you know, one of the reasons I invited uh, Commissioner Mermelstein is you know, this kind of a sample of some of the dilemmas and goals and, and, and achievements that governments have on the city level, let's say in the U.S., uh, but, but there are obviously similar uh, concerns and, and interests and agendas all over the world. And my question to you, Anton, is uh, what takeaway would you like for these leaders to have uh, from this type of discussion and what's available as solutions for these governments in terms of their goals, for example, to create jobs, mm -hmm. to elevate the level of society in terms of financial well-being, uh, in terms of bringing more stability into society through technologies. Yeah, yeah. So first of all, I would say uh, governments and regulators can have to make sure, let's say, decentralized finance, crypto, blockchain, etc. this is unstoppable. So it will definitely come. Uh, the earlier uh, governments or regions like the European Union or the US, etc., etc., are jumping on board and trying to find a consensus with, let's say, these uh, networks and with these uh, new financial services, the better it is. Secondly, I guess it gives completely new uh, uh, dimensions. So uh, let's say we are uh, a few minutes away to uh, lose the fight against uh, our uh, 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 against our planet Earth and about how we're destroying it. Uh, so there are infrastructure, there are projects uh, in, in environmental commodities. And I guess at the moment, everyone sees only, okay, we have to spend money. We have to spend money to develop these new kind of environmental commodities or to develop this infrastructure. Uh, developing this in the right way so that this is also a, a commodity, a financial instrument to participate so where everyone can participate in. I guess this is also an important thing that these kind of infrastructures can also be financed by, let's say, call it the crowd or by, let's say, many people and see this as a financial instrument through digital assets, through security uh, tokens, etc., etc. I guess this is also a point where governments and uh, regulators can jump in and therefore building a way of society which has a bit more, let's say, or is way more sensitive also in our sustainability and what we have to build on a welfare uh, which is out uh, beside, let's say, uh, profits, etc., etc. And therefore, I guess there are many possibilities in uh, developing asset backed financial instruments, also futures. Uh, related to uh, infrastructure, to uh, environmental commodities in yeah. the future. So this is, let's say, what I want to have from the governments. One is to take it serious, to make, to give frameworks for decentralized finance, for uh, crypto, for digital assets. And secondly, to also see what uh, uh, instruments uh, governments can develop on their own, uh, built on these kind of networks. Yeah, I find it fascinating, to be honest with you. Uh, when I first uh, realized the power of these types of platforms 
like Asadera has in terms of bringing liquidity and capital into uh, third world nations that have a lot of assets, have a lot of uh, natural resources, but don't have the money to exploit them. And that's available to them even without having to pull anything out of the ground. So I think it's just absolutely amazing. Uh, Edward, so uh, the same type of question, you know, we, we, you know, you talked about best practices and um, we have um, many representatives from many different countries and cities here with us today. Uh, and everybody's trying to t- take advantage of this opportunity to learn some of the best practices. Could you elaborate a bit on some of the particular agenda items that uh, you're carrying out um, uh, with the mayor uh, Adams in terms of uh, moving into the world where, you know, there would be more equality? And I know you spend massive part of your life uh, in philanthropy, so it doesn't surprise me that this is one of the big items that you brought up on the agenda. Uh, But in the same time, of course, developing business side of it, because financing has to come from somewhere. Yes, that, that's that's actually something that uh, we're thinking about and talking about every day is um, how do we meld the uh, technology, uh, the economy piece with um, with making sure that everyone in New York uh, gets lifted up at the same time, and uh, and this this is this is something that uh, we discuss not just internally um, in New York City, but uh, having. Uh, every council general from all over the world, having every ambassador from all over the world in New York uh, gives us that um, extra uh, little bit uh, that other countries don't have where we can reach out to our uh, colleagues uh, in uh, whichever country um, and ask them. And I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, We had a snowstorm uh, here that was... I would say fairly significant. Um, our mayor calls up and says, uh, "Call up every country that uh, has a similar uh, weather issue and find out what they do to uh, clean the streets." Um, and and th- this this is something that uh, not everyone has access to. So uh, we we have that benefit in New York City to uh, reach out to. Uh, practically any any country and anyone around the globe to give us uh, that extra lift. And whether it's having um, uh, the prime minister of Norway visit us and discuss uh, what they're doing um, with uh, post-COVID psychological issues uh, and how do we deal with um, the gun crisis that we have uh, in the city. And th- these are... Uh, small things, I guess, uh, in in one sense, but um, they they impact a place like New York City in in a very very serious way. And most of the people that they impact, um, uh, unfortunately, today uh, are uh, of uh, means that uh, can't afford uh, many many things. So our goal here is to use um, these contacts, uh, use use all the um, abilities that we have through the Office of International Affairs that is not really the same in most cities to reach out and, and get, um, and I hate to reuse the words best practices, but uh, get these um, uh, tidbits of gold from uh, people around the globe that have been doing it uh, for many, many years. So uh, countries like Sweden, uh, Norway, um, their, their social uh, structures are set up in such a way that um, it's it's uh, hard for us to fathom in a place like New York, but we're in many ways 20, 30 years behind. So these are conversations that really haven't been had uh, prior to uh, our administration. Um, and while uh, we've attended many meetings, this is an administration that actually wants to implement all of these um, great ideas that are global and um, in in one sense what's happening over the last week has brought the world together and hopefully has brought the world together uh, in a way where we can uh, talk to each other about how the world a better place um, for everyone around the globe not just uh, in new york city thank you edward okay well let's use uh remaining time and i'll take uh, a few questions uh, uh midha Uh, 
you are muted, you have to unmute yourself so we could hear you. I guess it's recording at the moment. Uh, hello. Uh, can yes, yeah. Thank you. Uh, my, myself, Amandeep from Denmark, and thanks for just referring to the Scandinavian nations. Um, well, we still look uh, at the U.S. for the individual freedoms, uh, though you mentioned the other way around. But my question is, uh, do you think it will become imperative for any digital asset provider to disclose their uh, geopolitical dependence of technology stack? Uh, the recent example is like MetaMask. Uh, the promise is a non-custodial wallet. It can be accessed by anyone. It's a peer-to-peer. -peer. But figured out that it depended on a service called Infura, which cut the cable. Anton, I guess that's, that's a question for you. Yeah. Thank you for very Yes. Uh, no, I, I would board. definitely not say that techno technical solutions uh, should be, let's say, regulated by governments. These are free and independent and open solutions. And therefore, I'm coming to the concept of, let's say, uh, how uh, uh, identities uh, uh, be managed in the future, let's say the concept of self-sovereign identities, but always in a way that, let's say, some compliance stuff or some, some uh, 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 verifications on transactions can be or must be uh, transferred to, let's say, regulated entities can be verified, especially, let's say, in a... In a, in a world, let's say, where I'm living in, I guess, the U.S. or Denmark, et cetera, et cetera, where you have to pay taxes and where you have to anyway do your uh, uh, tax statement every year. So uh, at the end of the day, you do it anyway. So technology, technology must be free. This must be independent and available over the world. But sanctions in the future may be on certain transactions. And this is still uh, given also in, let's say, any type or, or in many of the crypto exchanges centralized or decentralized that let's say as soon as I have a certain compliance a topic or a certain compliance behind it that maybe the one or other asset I'm not allowed or let's say uh, the system does not allow uh, to let's say uh, uh, sell to certain uh, clients from That's certain the issues, etc. This is, this is more or less the answer to it. We have uh, just a couple of minutes left and unfortunately mm -hmm. um, uh, former Minister of Development from Honduras mm -hmm. is texting me that he's just been having horrible uh, technical difficulties. So, uh, but he's a big supporter of what we do here at Harasses. Edward, I just want to come back to you very quickly, maybe for a quick um, 45 second summary of what the takeaway you'd like for people um, uh, to absorb from, from this discussion and, and most importantly from what's happening in New York City. Um, the, uh, the changes that have taken place uh, over the last couple of years and, uh, and uh, the, the issues that impact uh, uh, New York City are global issues. And uh, I think uh, New York has the opportunity as a leader that uh, the world looks to, to show how a city comes back. Um, I, I, I hope that uh, as... Uh, as one of the leaders of New York City, we can we can be that example uh, by uh, doing all the things that uh, everyone's talking about across the street from us at uh, the United Nations, implementing them and um, creating a city that uh, the world looks up to. Um, and that's our goal. Wonderful. Well, I certainly hope that these discussions and the bridges that we're building between governments and private enterprises uh, foster new levels of solutions to expedite uh, this evolution and increase in general social welfare of societies and cities and countries. And as they say, may, may there be peace on earth. So with that, I wanted to thank you very much. Uh, Anton, uh, thank you for sharing uh, um, what's, what's possible, what's available. Many economists still not aware of all the solutions that amazing organization like yours uh, can make available to them. And of course, uh, my best regards to the mayor, um, uh, for amazing job. Sounds very promising. We're all standing by and we wish uh, there to be enormous success. Thank you both very much. Thank you so much. Thanks so much. It was Everyone a pleasure. Everyone else, there's an amazing program continues, so don't go anywhere. Stay with us. I'm Stephen Melnick, politicalglobaldiplomacy.org. Till next time, be well. Thank you so much. Bye.